Namaste, it's the Chess Puzzler. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. Today we are going to cover the final installment of King vs. Pawn Endings as explained by one and only Grandmaster Yasser Sairawan in his book Winning Chess Endings. Today we are going to cover one new topic which is Pawn Breakthrough and along with that we are going to cover two spectacular ga games played by Yasser Sairawan in his past to explain the theory that uh, we have studied so far in King vs. Pawn Endings. By now, we have quite an arsenal of tricks to help us understand King and Pawn Endgames. A highlight of these endings, GM Yasser Sairawan's most favorite is Pawn Breakthrough. In this device, a player sacrifices a pawn, often two, to pursue a promotion. Well, that's what pawns are for, right? Recall the tempo tester exercise at the start of this chapter. If you played a few games, you might have found yourself in a position similar to what you see on the screen right now. White has the advantages of a superiorly, superiorly placed king and pawns that are further and more advanced. They are on the 5th rank while black has pawns on the 2nd rank or 7th rank. In this case, uh, GM Yasser Sairawan's uh, first teacher Jeffrey Parsons, he was playing black. GM Yasser Sairawan tried a lot of a uh, lot of uh, different moves in this particular position while playing white, but uh, could not really come up with the best possible move to start with. GM Sairawan started with King f5, King f7, King e5, King e7, King d5, King d7, c6. That's a check. King simply goes to c8. King e6, and now comes a6. C takes on b7. Well, after this, black can simply take, and black will have a king that is going to protect both the pawns, while white, king's, white king is far away. Despite uh, a lot of efforts, Yasser Sairawan could not come up with uh, the best first move in this case, which is b6. C takes on b6. And now you play something like a6, clearing the lane for the c pawn to promote. If b takes on a6, simply c6. And now, no matter what black plays, even if black tries to promote, white is very close to c8. And in two moves, it is going to promote itself to a queen. If you recall the concept of king in a square, that's what happens when white plays king f5, king f7. and now. King is going to be in the square of this white pawn. So even if white had a uh, white white could easily just pass through on the c file, the black king would be in the square and would be in time to promote uh, to stop the white white pawn from promoting. Which is why king f5 is not the first the best first move. Here's a little uh, brain teaser for you. After b6 we saw that black plays uh, c takes on b6 right what if black plays a, ta a takes on b6 can you find a solution to this uh, particular pattern if yes then please may please provide your answers in the comments section that let's look at one more example highlighting the importance and the criticality of using the pawn breakthrough at the right time <laughs> White is quite happy, uh, seeing that it has an advanced B pawn, while both the black pawns are quite far away, and black can simply, or white has a better chances of promoting, at least sooner than black can. So black jumps with a4, h5, a5, h4, b6, a takes. Now white has to stop to consider his move. He has a choice of which pawn to promote. He makes the right decision. It is going to be a a6 and not a takes on b6. h3, a7, h2, and now we queen on a8. The reason why we promote the a pawn is because had we taken a takes on b6, then in that case our promotion square would be on b8 on the dark square diagonal, right? So after after black also promotes its uh, pawn on the h1 square, white's queen will not be able to tackle that black queen at all, and it's going to be quite a drawish game. So instead, 
White heads on to promote his queen on the a8 square such that after pawn h1 queen, White can simply take, thus having a much superior position and winning the game. Now you may wonder why not simply play king c4 and enter the square of this particular pawn. The reason is after king c4, h5, king d5, h4, king e4, h3, king f3, h2, king g2. The problem here is black can just play king f7, which means while white is attacking the black pawns, black can easily reach out to all the pawns over here on the uh, white side as well, which in the end is going to be a win for black because white's king is going to be far away from action and while black's king is going to be very close to the black spawn, which may eventually end up prom getting promoted. With that, let's take out one final example in uh, the topic of pawn breakthrough. Now. Pause for a while and think what should be the best move for white. The possible options are moving the king away, uh, advancing the f-pawn, advancing the g-pawn. All right. I hope you gave, gave this some thought and you have some ideas of what would happen if uh, either one of these moves are made. Let's look at these in detail. The best move here for white is f5. King goes to b4. The reason why king moves is because if e takes on f5, g takes on f5, king b4, and e6 allows white to queen because black will simply take, white will take again, and white will promote. Even if black does not take or black remains where it is, white can simply promote on the e8 square. So to avoid this, the, after pawn f5, black plays king b4. And now white plays g5. This is a breakthrough sacrifice. He takes on f5 because if king plays something like king c5, then f6, g takes on f6, g, ta g takes on h6, and promotion is inevitable. Also, what's possible is instead of uh, king c5, perhaps h takes on g5 f6, g takes, and h1 promotion is in inevitable. So to prevent all of this, after f5, b4, g5, white takes on, white takes on f5, and now we push g6. If black takes, then we can promote the e pawn. If black does not take, then we promote, we take on f7 and push the pawn and if black simply pushes the pawn forward to f6 then we promote the e pawn once again i hope this idea is clear and i hope you are able to understand what pawn break breakthroughs are about with this we are going to look at one of saravan's uh, games saravan here is playing black pieces against an international master fernando cruz in olympiad 1994 uh yes saravan is contemplating several moves for example, one of the moves that he had in mind was uh, rook f5. King will play something like b4, and rook takes on h2, thus winning a pawn. However, white's advanced passer on c4 will actually offer a good counterplay. Sairavan also was considering something like rook a5 and trading the rooks. But he eventually decided that none of these moves are really that good. So he also thought that if he's able to blockade the c4 square by having a piece uh, on the c5 square, it uh, he would be able to pass on, he would be able to engineer a very interesting breakthrough with pawns while sacrificing two of the pawns and go, going into a queen ending eventually. But then once again, he decided he's going to be worse off. So he started with a move rook a5. Nevertheless, king goes to b3, rook takes on a2, king takes on a2. By this time, Fernando Cruz was flabbergasted. He was surprised 
and uh, all of Yasser Sarawan's uh, teammates uh, representing the United States of America, they had also lost hopes from this game and they left the playing hall. But Yasser Sarawan was pretty confident about his 21-move combination. Yes, you heard it right, 21-move. He continues with King d6, King b3, King c5, King c3. In general, such endings favor the side with the outside passer. This is because the passed pawn forces the opposing king to either step into a blockade or move over to win it. Once the king is either on the defensive or out of the way, the other player's king has the opportunity to raid the other side of the board. As you can see, the black uh, king is trying to keep this white pawn in check. While it does that, white can simply just move on this side of the board and gobble up all the black spawns and escort the white pawns to victory. However, in this case, the favorable position of the g4 pawn helps black helps black uh, keep the entire white's king side frozen because the moment he plays h3 or f3 white can simply just take or black can simply just take and uh, sorry white black can simply just take and march its pawn forward for promotion and yasa sara one was depending completely on that g4 g4 pawn white can move his king only back and forth however black can't move his king at all. There is no way, there is no place where uh, black can go. The moment uh, black moves, the pawn will march or the and the king will march along with it. So black had to move his pawns. What did Yasa Sarawan do? He played e5, followed by king d3 and f5, king c3 and e4. As you can see, black spawns have advanced a lot while white king is in the same place because white just can't afford to move just as yet because the moment it goes away from the c4 pawn, black, black king will take it up and protect all of these pawns to promotion. White continues with king b3 and now we play h6. Black wants to advance his pawns to engineer a breakthrough, but he has to be very careful with how the pawns are advanced. It is useful to keep white's king away from the king's side on the less active b3 square. You can see white king is really far away from all the pawn action that's going on on the left side of the board. And triangulation is not the only way to lose tempo. Now white plays something like king c3, h5, king b3 once again. White simply cannot afford to abandon the production of the c4 pawn, which is right here. Say white had played something like king d2, king takes on c4, king e3, king c3, king f4, king d2, king takes on f5, king e2. King takes on e4, king f2, king f4, king g2, king g5, king takes on h2, king takes on h5, and king takes on g3. Now you'll see that black's lone g4 pawn will be the hero. Yes, Yasasaira 1 was able to read so many lines of the board without touching even a single piece, and that's why he is the Yasasaira 1. So after king b3, it's time for black to, uh, to present a breakthrough with f4. Why? Because something like king d4 would absolutely lose. White will play, white will play something like king b4, king d3, and c5. And now black is not going to be able to catch up with this pawn while having white's king protecting its entire journey to promotion of the c1 square. Therefore, black simply plays f4, g takes f4. Black was quite cautious and that's the reason why rather than pushing the pawn uh, forward on the g file, 
black simply played king to e5 after which uh, fernando cruz the international master fernando cruz actually resigned yes uh, yes sir one was able to snatch victory from such a tricky position while uh, his entire team in the usa <laughs> they they had lost hope but well gm yasa sairo one is one of the greatest this is how the game would have con uh, continued something like c5 black knew that it is actually in the square of uh, both these pawns so would be able to stop both of them in the end king would play something like uh, take king takes on f5 c6 King goes to e6. King b5. White is supporting his passer. Now black has a decision to make. To which square will he promote his pawn? Can you figure it out? Well, this is what black plays next. g3. H takes. And now we'll play h3. Since white has a long journey to make on the uh, to, to, to queen. Black simply marches on the edge file. This will be followed by something like uh, King B6, H2, C7, King D7, King B7, and we queen with check. Black knew that uh, to support this white pawn. The white king will have to be on the light diagonal. It's going to have going to be on the b7 square, and therefore checking from b7, checking from uh, h1 is the best best move rather than taking the pawn on g3 and promoting it on the g1 square. After the rook sacrifices took place, you could see white could only move his king. And second, GM Yasser Sairawan was assisted by knowledge of a lot of breakthrough uh, pawn breakthrough themes and also king versus pawn endings and uh, he realized that his king would be in the square of the promoting promoting pawns well and who does not love and who does not love having a pawn promoting with check on b7 all these calculations he was able to do and he was able to do only and only by learning internalizing the themes the the king and pawn tactics that we have we are learning in this uh, in this book so far with that let's move on to the game that we we were waiting for with bated breath in this case yasa sairawan is playing gary kasparov sairawan with white pieces and kasparov with black pieces this was in 1983 where uh, yasa sairawan actually loses to a young gary kasparov Sairawan was outplayed throughout the game and was now in an inferior pawn ending. The key factor that gave Gary Kasparov the superior position was the outside passed pawn. In a situation like this, Black's queenside pawns are mobile and capable of uh, forcing a b-pawn. A factor that forces White's king to remain on guard and preventing the b-pawn from queening. Black has the option to jettison his b pawn so that when white king white's king moves over to pick up the passed b pawn, black's king can gorge itself on white's king side. Study this pattern. Study this board carefully. At this point, Yasa Sairawan was uh, running out of time and also facing a critical decision. The choice that he had was between the move king d4, keeping the black king at bay, or e4 setting up a wall against the black king so that the black cannot move further ahead what should white play can you cover all the different moves and uh, compare it with this particular answer which i'm going to share with you right now and see if you've if you've mastered the king and pawn endings yet the correct move over here is uh, king d4 however White actually played king e4, pawn, pawn uh, moving to e4 in this case, which was a move from which uh, Yasa Sairawan did not recover at all, and the young Gary Kasparov took the game. Although a uh, thumb rule is that an active uh, king should be chosen over a pawn push, there are various unique scenarios when these principles don't really work uh, or, or come in handy, so you need to be aware of a larger picture at hand, which you see on the board. 
let's just study how the game would have been had uh, Yasser Sarawan played King D4 in order to understand the pawn, pawn and King endings a bit better. This would be this could be replied by either something like uh, f4 or g5. Let's see how g5 would work. Uh, against this, the only good move that white has is f4 because if uh, white plays something like g4, then we will have a5, and we'll see that the e pawn over here is uh, quite laggard. So after g5, white plays f4 followed by f6 black is being very careful black does not want to play something like uh, f5 which will give an opportunity for f takes on g5 f takes on g5 and h4 giving a chance giving giving white a chance of having an outside passer so instead of f5 black simply plays f6 to which white plays e4 a5 and now h4 g takes h4 black is trying to break up white's king side you can see all the pawns over here uh, black is trying to break those if he tries to keep pawns on the board with something like uh, say g4 then h5 is the best move king will go to c6 and e5 if f takes on e5 king takes on e5 and king will have uh, white will have a protected pass pawn on the f file protected by its king which is definitely going to escort it until the promoting square therefore black plays g takes on h4 uh, not keeping the pawns in place not keeping the pawns on the board followed by g takes on h4 and h5 black has now gained the opposition as you can see here i hope you remember the concept of, of uh, opposition from our forced video on king versus pawn endings white is forced to make a simplification plays e5 f takes e5 f takes e5 king king e6 king c5 b4 a takes b takes king takes and king takes on e5 now king c3 king f4 King d2, king g3, king e1, king takes, king f2. Now white king is just in time to stop black's h pawn from queening and therefore securing a draw. Now let's go back a few moves and uh, play out the entire game once again with the first move not being g5 but being something like say f5 as before we know that black is trying to limit white's advance and culling the herd that is uh, creating a weak white pawn on the king side if black is able to create a weakness in white's king side structure he will then use it use his queen side majority as a decoy and win white's king side pawns so white plays a4 followed by a5 black is ready to trade off the queen side pawns uh, as you can see here and then attack the king side by rooting his king to d6, d5. Sorry, uh, we already have it on d6, d6, d5, and e4. So, to put out a best defense, white plays e4. White is just in time to trade off the laggard e3 pawn. It was lagging, had to trade it off. And black accepts, followed by king takes on e4 king c5 and g4 at this point the game is drawn and the concluding moves might uh, well be something like b4 a takes a takes f5 g takes g takes king d6 king d4 h5 king c4 King e5, king takes, king takes, king c3, king g4, and we have seen this, uh, and we, 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 we have seen how this ends. While black captures the white pawn on the edge file, well, white king will be close enough to stop the black pawn from promotion and therefore ending this game in a draw.
Now, once again, let's go back uh, to the top of uh, where we started from and play what Yasser Sarawan actually played. Now, your job is to understand what Gary Kasparov would play after that to seal a victory. Remember, Gary Kasparov is not a feeder champion yet, but well, we know he, well, he just reigned over the world of chess for over two decades. If Black played something like e4, which Black unfortunately played in this case, White will play the best move possible, which is g5. This move is difficult uh, to anticipate. Black is trying to separate and isolate White's kingside structure, making it as fragile as possible. Uh, his threat is to play g5, g4, which will freeze White's kingside completely because then none of the pawns will be able to move because if they move, Black would simply take and then march to promotion on either side of the board. So after playing after playing g5, uh, White's best move over here is f4. G takes on f4. Naturally, Black creates two groups of pawn islands for White. And uh, if you wanted to play something like g4, then that would allow e5. We will have a beautiful chain uh, for white will have a beautiful chain of pawns which will be much stronger in the end game so to avoid that white sim black simply takes and king plays king g takes on f4 king c5 this is an excellent move black's king is brought to an active position white can now only wait if it tries to push his central pawns by something, say, f5, then f6, they are weakened and white will immediately lose. So instead, after king c5, white plays king c3, a5, king d3. The ending has shifted uh, to this particular position, which is quite uh, tricky for white to come out of. And Gary Kasparov masterfully wins the game by playing h5. This is a very pow powerful move which forces uh, further concessions. White cannot advance his center pawns because they lack support and they will soon fall. Remaining with uh, remaining passive with the king, which would mean king c3, b4 check, a takes, a takes, again with a check, king d3, h4 h3 b3 king c3 b2 is not an option this is a typical device the passer is tossed away as a decoy uh, as you as you can see white is going to go after this particular pawn while the black king enjoys feasting on the white pawns and helping the other pawns promote on the other side of the board so after black plays h5 White simply plays h4. It is important to stop uh, the black's h pawn from advancing, but the cost is weakening the g3 square. Now, what's next? b4, a4. This allows black to establish a protected passed pawn that we have over here. This is better than losing it uh, to something like it, losing it to a takes, a takes. This will be followed by f6. Black forces another concession. Did you realize what would happen if uh, what would happen after something like b3 when the pawn advances? Well, white will be white kings will be after the b pawn as a decoy, and we already learned that the black king is going to go after the pawns on the king side of white and help the other two pawns that it has to promotion. So instead, black plays f6, and the only good move that white has in this case is f5 and commit his center pawns. Dropping back with uh, something like king d2, king d4 is not even a fight because, well, you can see. Also, will not help is king e3 and king c4 because black will now face another critical decision because his position has reached its maximum. So what do we do now in this case? 
after the move f5 black plays king c6 do you remember this do you remember this theory it's triangulation of course black wants to recreate the entire position such that it is white's turn to move because if black plays something like b3 king c3 b2 king takes on b2 and king d4 king b3 king takes on e4 king c4 king takes on f5 king b5 king g4 will reach the same queen ending when white has practical chance to save the game therefore white or black rather prefers to do triangulation yes gary kasparov showing you how to do triangulation first hand learn from it white will play something like king c4 king c7 king d3 and king d7 this was beautiful beautiful move by gary kasparov demonstrating how triangulation helps you win the game king goes to e3 and finally king comes to c6 because after something like king d6 king d4 black would not have made any progress so instead black goes to king c6 king d3 and now king c5 so we are back to the position where we were earlier when Kari Kasparov started uh, triangulating his king. But now in this case, it's Yasa Sairavan to move to his dismay. After king c5, Yasa Sairavan plays uh, king e3, b3, king d3, king b4. Well, actually, even b2. Is a good move it wins but uh, gary kaspera would have played king b4 e5 and king a3 white has no other choice but to resign in this case this was a flawless end game by gary kasparov an indication of why he became a fide champion this post-mortem of this entire game was a joint effort by the by the legend of the legends Gary Kasparov and Yasa Yasa Sarawan together. And uh, Yasa Sarawan at this point also jokes in his book saying that the word post-mortem is quite appropriate because this was death of white pieces at the hands of uh, the murderer Gary, Kasp Gary Kasparov. With that, uh, we have come to an end of uh, King vs. Pawn endings. We are going to continue this entire series until I finish this book winning chess endings learning whatever Yasa Sairawan has to teach and also sharing the knowledge with you. But uh, doing so comes at a cost of a lot of time, a lot of investment and a lot of learning. So I do hope that you'll appreciate the same by doing something that's quite free for you, uh, liking these videos, sharing your comments as to how can I make things better for you and finally subscribing to my channel. It's the Chess Puzzler signing out.